Sergeant Preston of the Yukon. On King Honyo Husky. Gold. Gold discovered in the Yukon. Back to the days of the gold rush. And the adventures of Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog, Yukon King, as they meet the challenge of the Yukon in their relentless pursuit of lawbreakers. The Quaker Oats Company, makers of Quaker Pop Wheat and Quaker Pop Rice, the delicious cereals shot from guns, and the Mutual Broadcasting System, presents by special recording, Sergeant Preston of the Yukon. Our adventure will begin in just a moment. What do the initials G-O-C stand for? You'd better know because someday they may save your life. G-O-C stands for the Ground Observer Corps, the vital civilian arm of our nation's air defense system. Day and night, in thousands of observation posts and air defense filter centers, your friends, your neighbors are standing guard, protecting you from a surprise enemy attack that could come at any moment. Our security, our very survival, depends on adequate warning. Our radar network is in constant operation. But only human eyes and ears can fill the gaps in our radar system. Do your part. Serve just a few spare hours a week. One million volunteers are desperately needed. Contact Civil Defense and join the Ground Observer Corps today. You're really needed. This message is brought to you as a public service. Amelia arrived in Dawson during the first blizzard of the winter. Ice had already formed on the river, and it was clear that the Amelia would be tied up on the Dawson waterfront until spring. But the crew had been aware of that possibility before they left St. Michael. And so after the cargo had been unloaded, they went ashore to celebrate the beginning of a long vacation. Johnny Donahue, the second mate, returned to the waterfront shortly after midnight. He was humming one of the songs he had heard at the music hall, and lifting his face to the refreshing bright of the driven snow. He rounded the corner of a warehouse. The lights of the Amelia shone ahead, warm and inviting. And suddenly, Johnny felt a rough hand on his shoulder. Hey. He was whirled around, and he found himself face to face with a brute of a man, black-eyed and black-bearded. What's the idea? You know what the idea is. Then Johnny saw the knife in the big man's hand. Don't, Mr. Ryan. I haven't got any money. It won't do any good to pretend you don't know him. I never saw you before in my life. You saw me at the music hall tonight. They caught you watching me close. I swear. Don't lie, Johnny Johnny. You What? You remember all right. But you gotta tell me one thing. How did you manage to get through it? Through what? The typhoon that wrecked the China Bell. You. You're Ben Baxter. You knew that. You knew that when you first set eyes on me tonight. And I could see in your face what you were planning to do. Turn me over to the police. No, Ben, I swear. That's my question. How did you manage to get through the typhoon? The ship broke up. There was a hatch floating close to me. I pulled myself up on it. Two days later, a steamer picked me up. You were the only survivor? Except for you and the men you took with you in the lifeboat. They all went overboard when we caught our first set of land. You? Me. I had the gun, remember? You and I are the only survivors. That's one too many. No, Ben, I won't say anything to the police. I give you my word. There's one way to make sure you don't talk. No, Ben, no. The Northwest Mounted Police Headquarters wasn't far from the waterfront. And King, who was burled in the snow outside waiting for his master to come off duty, heard Johnny scream. He jumped to his feet and then raced toward the dock where the Amelia was tied up. There, near the corner of the warehouse, he saw the man lying in the snow and the patch of red growing larger beside him. He turned and ran back to headquarters. He threw himself against the door. A moment later, the sergeant opened it. What's the matter, boy? 
King ran a few steps toward the waterfront and then turned, clearly asking his master to follow him. All right, King. As soon as I get into my parker, hold the fort, Constable. King's found something he wants me to investigate. Right, sir. Lead the way, boy. When the sergeant reached Johnny, he knelt beside him and made a hurried examination. He's been stabbed half a dozen times, King, but he's still alive. We'll get him to the hospital. <laughs> Crimes of violence were rare in Dawson, and the miners were indignant over the assault on Johnny Donahue. The bulletins from the hospital became the most important news in town. And when there was a decided improvement in the young mate's condition on the second or third day, there was a real celebration. But it was not until the following morning that Johnny was strong enough to answer any questions. This is Sergeant Preston, Johnny. Hi. We'd like to know who's standing. It was Ben Vax. The sergeant turned to Constable Downey. Do you know Baxter, Jim? Uh, yes, sergeant. He's still in town. Pick him up. Right. Now then, Johnny, I'd like to hear a little more about this. How did it happen and why? Uh, it was easy enough. He followed me from the music hall and let me have it when we reached the waterfront. And the why? He thought I recognized him. I didn't. I wouldn't have with that beard covering most of his face. And it had been over two years. Since what? Since Ben was the bosun of the China Bell, I was the third mate. We were on our way from Borneo to Manila when the typhoon hit us in the Sulu Sea. It was the worst storm I ever saw, and after 24 hours, the ship began to break up. There was nothing to do but abandon it. I was at the wheel when the captain went below to get his papers and his money box. He didn't come back. The first mate had been washed overboard. The second mate had been killed when the foremast cracked and hit him as it fell. That made me second in command of the skipper. When he didn't show up, I turned the wheel over to one of the men and went below myself. I found the captain in his cabin, dead, with a bullet through his heart. And the ship's papers and the money box were gone. I rushed up to the deck, and the seaman, Marty Jones, was, met me at the top of the companionway. Mr. Donahue. Marty, the captain's been murdered. It must have been Baxter who did it. What is it? That ain't all. He stove in all the lifeboats but the one in the stern, and he's got six men lowering that now. Has he gone crazy? Here's the captain's money box and the captain's sister. There's no stopping him. He means to take off and leave the rest of us to go down with the ship. It was all true. All of the lifeboats were stove in with the exception of the one in the stern. When I got back there, it had already been lowered and six men were in it at the oars. I saw Baxter toss the captain's money box down to them. He was going over the rail and down the rope ladder when I yelled at him. Baxter, stop! Hey, where you are, Mr. Tully Hughes. Every jump but the one I'm holding is was tossed overboard. That makes me the captain of the ship. This is mutiny. Sure. You can report it when you get to David Jones' block. Have you gone crazy? I don't think so. I've got $20,000 and a pit crew to handle my boat. Rest of your city. Ha! <laughs> Sergeant, the other night just before he stabbed me, Baxter told me he'd killed every one of the men he'd taken with him as soon as they sighted land. And you and the rest of the crew? The ship went down. I managed to crawl on top of a hatch. By a miracle, I was picked up two days later. I was the only survivor. And the only one who could bring Baxter to justice. I made a full report to the Maritime Commission, but no one ever heard of Baxter again. We thought he never made it to land. They imagined he was safe until he saw you the other night. He would have been safe. I didn't recognize him. I suppose no man with so much guilt on his conscience could ever feel safe. But you rest easy, Johnny, and you may rest assured the Northwest Mounted Police will capture him. However, in spite of his words, the sergeant felt no certainty that the killer's capture would be easy. And he was fully prepared for Constable Downey's report. Go on, Sergeant. I thought he might be. He's been staying at the palace. Checked out last night. Anyone see him leave town? Uh, yes, he was driving a dog team and heading south. Oh. But it snowed since then. There'll be no tracks to follow. Leave anything in his room? Some dirty clothes. I, I brought this flannel shirt. Good. That'll give King the scent. You're going after him, Sergeant? Yes, I've arranged it with the inspector. As soon as I get a complete description of Baxter and his team, we'll hit the trail. We'll 
we'll continue our adventure in just a moment. Attention, everybody in the family. First call for the breakfast treat that can't be beat. Quaker pop rice or Quaker pop wheat. They're the ones shot from guns. They're crisp, tender, full of bang-up flavor because they're loaded up to eight times normal size. Just top with milk and your favorite fruit for a delightful breakfast treat that really wakes up appetite. And say, as you mothers know, some of your family like their cereal not so sweet, some like it ever so sweet. Well, here's the beauty of Quaker Pop rice and Quaker Pop wheat. They're the good natural grains with the sunny natural flavor that old Mother Nature puts into them. They're not factory sweetened, and no sugar is added. Your family can sweeten them the way they like them, with just the amount of sugar they like. So, for an appetite waker-upper every morning, let your whole family enjoy the one shot from guns. Delicious, nourishing Quaker Pop rice or Quaker Pop wheat. Now to continue. The ice on the Yukon was still too thin for travel. And another blizzard swept down from the north to pile mountainous drifts all along the banks of the river. They were too large for King to fight his way through, and the sergeant was forced to put on snowshoes and walk ahead of the team, packing down the snow so they could follow. Even worse than the slow progress was the thought that with the trail cleared of any sense, they might not even be going in the right direction. Still, the sergeant continued heading south, and at Buck Martin's way cabin at the mouth of Indian Creek, he found his reward. Buck, I'm on the trail of a killer. I hope he's passed this way. Big man, black beard, black eyes. I knew it. When I first caught sight of him, I said this is a tough customer. If he stays the night, you aren't going to close your eyes, Martin. But he didn't stay here last night? No, the storm had been blowing for two hours by the time he got here. Early yesterday afternoon. His dogs were floundering, but he said he had to go on. He left his team here and borrowed a pair of snowshoes from me. That makes you an accessory. Sergeant, I didn't know he was a killer. Of course you didn't. I wasn't serious. Which way to go? Up Indian Creek. That's interesting. South from Dawson and now east. He may be making a wide circle to the north, or he may be trying to cross the divide into the northwest territory. Well, this has been a terrible storm. You may find him dead on the trail. I doubt it, Buck. I have an idea it'll take more than a storm to kill this murderer. Late that afternoon, near the headwaters of Indian Creek, the sergeant found some snowshoe tracks, which had been only partially covered by snow. Okay. Hey. He stopped the sled and let King sniff Ben Baxter's shirt and pointed to the tracks. King took one more sniff and then... Without hesitation, King started north, the same direction the tracks were heading. Good boy. Must be a long way ahead, but you'll be able to follow his trail from now on. Three days passed. Ben Baxter had avoided most of the way cabins on his route. He had only rested for a few hours when he did stop. Now, as he reached the edge of the black forest, at the top of a long slope, he dropped to the ground and looked back at the valley he'd just crossed. There was something moving at the far end. It would. Quickly, he pulled a spyglass from his knapsack and adjusted it. Sergeant Preston, none of you must have talked. I should have put a bullet through instead of using a knife. But I've got to keep moving. He pulled himself clumsily to his feet and started on into the forest, following an old game trail. It grew dark within the next hour, and when he saw the lights of a cabin ahead of him, his instinct was to swing away from it. But someone hailed him. A young trapper waved to him. Hello. Hello. Looking for some place to spend the night? Well, yeah. Well, you're welcome, stranger. My partner and I haven't had company for over a month. Are you hungry? Sure am. Supper should be on the table. Uh, just a second while I pick up this firewood. Here, I'll give you a hand. Oh, no, no, no need for that. There isn't much. <laughs> yeah, I got it. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> This will be a real treat. Hey, Matt! We have company. Open the door. Yeah, I'll open it for you. All right, thanks. Go on in. As the trapper entered the cabin, Ben brought the barrel of his revolver down hard, and the trapper slumped to the floor. His partner stared at Ben across the supper table. Uh, get your hands up and stand with your face to the wall. No. Do as I say. I'll put a bullet through you. All right. But instead of turning toward the wall, a second trapper whirled and ran for the door at the rear of the cabin. Before he could open it, however, Ben was on top of it and brought down his revolver once more. The Northwest mud, it always helps the helpless. Huh? Well, that's as good a way to set an ambush as any. Swiftly, Ben bound the two trappers hand and foot. Then he wolfed some food. 
Afterwards, he tossed the first trapper over his shoulder and left the captain. <laughs> When King reached the cabin, wolves were howling in the forest not far away. The great lead dog looked back at his master, and the sergeant called a halt. Okay, hurry up, come on. Trouble here, King. Help! Help me! Who tied you up? It must have been the same hombre who knocked my partner out. Followed him through the front door and then cracked him over the head with his gun. Big man with a black beard. Yeah. His name's Ben Baxter. Wanted for murder. There you are. He may have killed Tom. Your partner? Yeah. I tried to make a break for it, but this big gunman knocked me out, too. When I came to, I was tied up the way you saw me. The gunman and my partner were gone. Listen, you've taken him out in the forest and left him for the wolves. I'll we'll find him. You'll be too late. Wolves don't howl when they're attacking. I'll get you out of harness, King. See those tracks in the snow leading away from the cabin? The killer track. was carrying something heavy. Probably your partner. All right, King. Here's your trail. Fine, boy. Fine. King plunged into the forest with a sergeant close behind him. But this was one time the great dog couldn't wait for his master. On he ran, deeper and deeper into the forest, until at last he reached the small clearing, just as the wolf pack was closing in on the still figure of the young trapper, King Charles. The wolf pack turned on him, but he flashed right and left until he had forced a way through to the trap. There he stood at bay, ready to defend the fallen man to the death. But the sergeant was close behind him, and when he opened fire on the wolves, the pack turned and ran. Then, just as the sergeant was about to kneel beside the trapper, another shot rang out. The sergeant dropped to the ground, clutching his leg. But he rolled behind a tree and poured lead in the direction in which the shot had come. There was no answering fire. And a few minutes later, the sergeant could hear someone crashing through the underbrush some distance away. No, King, we can't go after him. This bullet caught my leg. <laughs> King, you can bring the team in the sled, can't you, boy? <laughs> go on, King, get the team and bring it here. <laughs> when King returned with the team, the trapper was with him. First, he lifted his partner onto the sled, and then he helped the sergeant aboard. And they started back to the cabin. <laughs> The Black Forest trading post was five miles beyond the trapper's cabin. When Ben Baxter arrived there, he was desperately tired. But he felt sure the sergeant wouldn't be able to follow him for some time with a bullet in his right leg. Baxter needed rest, and he needed a dog team to continue his flight. Both to be obtained at the post. Still, he walked on past it for a good half mile before he circled back through the forest to the rear door. Through the kitchen window, he could see a woman and a boy. Needing sleep, he decided to postpone any violence until it was time for him to leave. Hello. Hello, son. I wonder if your pa could put me up for the night. My pa isn't here. He's gone to Beaver City. Well, ask your ma then. Eh? Well, pa told me I was the man around the post while he was gone, and... Well, I, I don't think we can put you up. Now, buddy, we've never refused a night's lodging to a traveler as long as we've been running the post. Of course, you may, stranger. Come on in. Well, thank you, ma'am. I'm Martha Haynes, and this is Buddy. Well, I'm pleased to meet you. They call me Smitty. How do you do? Uh, would you like something to eat? Uh, no, thanks. Just some warm place where I might roll up in a blanket. We'll put a cot in the store for you right next to the stove. You'll be real comfortable there. Uh, go get that canvas cot and set it up, buddy. All right, Ma. If you say so. And so it happened that Ben slept in the store that night. He didn't bother to undress, simply pulled off his boots. And tired as he was, he slept like a dead man. He scarcely stirred until the sun was streaming through the windows. As soon as he opened his eyes and realized how late it was, he sprang into action. With his boots on, he started for the window to take a look at the trail. When the door to the living quarters at the rear of the store opened, and Mrs. Haynes and Buddy came in. Well, Mr. Smith, did you have a good sleep? How would you like some breakfast? Uh, yeah, I'll have to be on my way fast, though. Say, uh, are those your dogs out here? Nope. Those are out here now. There's somebody coming down the trail. I'll go see. It could be your father. Nope. Nope, they're coming from the wrong direction. Hey, I know that team. You do? Sure, that's King of the League. Huh? He's working loose. Looks to me like he's on the on the trail of, of some crooks. Get away from that with it. Let me see. Hey, quit pushing. 
It is. Sergeant's right in the sled instead of standing up and back. What do you make of that, Ma? Why, I don't know. <laughs> what are you opening that window for? Keep away from me. I'm going to stop that muddy once and for all. Fuck! I told you he was a crook. I told you. And the sergeant's after him. Uh, fill him full of lead. No, you won't. Wait and see. You won't shoot anybody, see? I took all the bullets out of your gun <laughs> last night when you were asleep. <laughs> Why, you little imp? Where are they? I threw them out in the snow. Go and look for them. I'll break your neck. Hey, take your hands off him. I'll attend to him later. You'll have some more ammunition that'll fit this gun. Where is it? I took it all and hid it in the woods. Try and find it. Let's you... go of him. Let's go Not a chance. Look, I still have a knife. I'm going to take this boy out in the kitchen. The knife will be this throat every minute. You get rid of the sergeant. Tell him I headed north before daylight. If you don't get rid of him, your boy will die. You understand that? You wouldn't die. Oh, wouldn't I? I'm wanted for half a dozen murders now. One more won't make any difference. All right, I'll do as you say. And you, you'll keep your mouth shut. Oh, uh, stop. Shut, I said. All right, get going out in the kitchen. We'll continue our adventure in just a moment. Get ready, get set for a thrilling announcement. Sergeant Preston of the Yukon goes on TV. Yes, your favorite radio show will be seen for the first time on television. Brought to you by all the Quaker cereals. Quaker pop wheat and rice, Quaker oats and mother's oats, Moffat shredded wheat, and Quaker Paco 10. It's a brand new and different television adventure series for the whole family. Think of the thrills. You'll see Sergeant Preston in hand-to-hand combat with desperados. You'll see him on his black horse Rex. You'll see the sergeant's great dog, Yukon King. You'll see the magnificent mountain scenery, rushing rapids, terrifying snow slides, avalanches in this coldest country of the north. The first dramatic television show starring Sergeant Preston will be Thursday evening, September 29th, on a coast-to-coast network. Check the time and station in your local newspaper. Everybody, the whole family, get ready, get set to see Sergeant Preston of the Yukon on television. to continue. Mrs. Payne sank to the cot and buried her head in her hands as the sergeant stopped his team out in front. But when the door opened, she rose to her feet and tried to compose herself. The sergeant was walking with the help of his rifle, and King trotted in beside him. Good morning, Mrs. Payne. Good morning, sergeant. Oh, you've been hurt. Yes, I managed to stop a bullet last night, but it isn't serious. I see you have a cot set up out here. Traveler last night? Yes, Sergeant. Big man with a black beard? Yes, his name was Smith. He has other names. Well, he he left here some time ago. He took the trail to the north. I saw the track. King, of course, knew the man they'd been following was out in the kitchen. And now he growled to attract the sergeant's attention. The sergeant was looking straight into Mrs. Haynes' eyes. They were filled with terror. And the sergeant could guess the possible reason. As a matter of fact, you've been entertaining a fugitive from justice, Mrs. Haynes. You can help be getting after him. Here, boy. Come on. I'll see you later, Mrs. Haynes. Well, you, you're always welcome, Sergeant. <sighs> Mrs. Haynes sank down on the cot again as the door closed. The kitchen door opened as the sergeant drove away. He's gone. I'll keep myself. Move along, Buster. My name is Buster. And keep that knife away from me. Yeah. There he goes around the bend. Now, we'll have to move fast. Put some supplies in my knapsack, Mrs. Flour, tea, matches, beans, bacon. Load it up. All right. You'll never get away from Sergeant Press. Oh, uh, won't I, though? He'll get you. By the time he finds out I'm not on the trail ahead, I'll have your dog team harnessed, and I'll be traveling south. But before I go, you're going to show me where you hit that ammunition. You, hurry up with those supplies. I'm hurrying as fast as I can. Martha took as long as she could to fill Ben's knapsack with food. But at last, it was impossible to delay any longer. The knapsack was filled. Ben ordered Buddy to take it. And then he pushed the boy ahead of him toward the kitchen door. Uh, get moving, Sprout. First, you find the ammunition. After which, you're coming with me. Oh, you're not taking him with you. Of course I am. You'll make a fine shield to stop bullets. Oh. Then he come my way. Open the door, boy. Uh, what you... 
Yeah. So when the door was opened, Buddy was suddenly pulled from Ben's grasp and pushed aside. Ben found himself face to face with the sergeant. He slashed at him with his knife, but the sergeant deflected the stroke with the butt of his rifle and then followed through. The heavy wood stock crashed solidly against Ben's head, and the big man dropped to the floor. Oh, Buddy, Buddy, are you all right? Yes, Mom. But Sergeant, Sergeant, I couldn't say anything. He had Buddy out in the kitchen with a knife at his throat. King told me he was out there. But your face told me it would be dangerous to open that kitchen door. We drove down the trail until the trees hit us and then circled back through the woods. That was slick. Boy, is he out cold. Would you like to put the handcuffs on him? I sure would. There you are, son. He said he was wanted for a half a dozen murders. Is that right, Sergeant? Not in the Yukon, buddy. His murders were committed thousands of miles from here. They'll be sent back to stand trial for them. He's traveled a long, long way, and he'll travel still farther. He'll find the just penalty for his crimes waiting at the end of the trail when the judge says this case is closed. We'll return in just a moment with a word about our next exciting adventure. Your musical treat of the day waits for you throughout the week on Mutual. Each Tuesday and Thursday evening, it's time for Eddie Fisher and a session of music as everyone likes it. Young and old delight in Eddie Fisher's way with a song. And he's joined on every show by Fred Robbins as MC, Alex Stordo's orchestra, and outstanding guest stars. Every Saturday, the teenager's favorite, Johnny Desmond, brings phonorama time and a roundup of the newest and best in popular recordings. On Sundays, the Enchanted Hour presents favorite music from the world's best-loved composers. Every weekday also means time for Hawaii calls and authentic melodies of the islands. Music fills mutual air throughout the week. Hear the Eddie Fisher Show, Johnny Desmond with Phonorama Time, Enchanted Hour, and Hawaii calls on mutual throughout the week over most of these stations. natural for Sergeant Preston to dislike capturing for the hangman the individual who saved his life. The Mountie doesn't suspect that he was snatched from the jaws of death only so the rescuer who hated lawmen could send him to a far more painful end. Be sure to hear this next exciting adventure. These Sergeant Preston of the Yukon Adventures are brought to you every Monday through Friday at this time by the Quaker Oats Company, makers of Quaker Pop Wheat and Quaker Pop Rice, the delicious cereals shot from guns. By special recording in cooperation with the Mutual Broadcasting System. They are a copyrighted feature of Sergeant Preston of the Yukon Incorporated. Created by George W. Trendle, produced by Trendle Campbell Muir Incorporated, and directed by Fred Flowerday. The part of Sergeant Preston is played by Paul Sutton. This is J. Michael wishing you goodbye, good luck, and good health from Quaker Pop Wheat and Quaker Pop Rice. So long. This is Mutual, radio network for all America. Thank you.